We're going to move swiftly on to David Smith from Sheffield Hallam. He stepped in at the last minute because somebody got their dates muddled up and was no longer able to present. He's been collaborating with Bob Lasseur, who presented at last meeting, and uh, there's an extension to the, the Do Explore Act protocol, which David is going to share with us. So, David, whenever you're ready. So, yeah, this is, um, this is a story that came together very quickly and came together because of um, the network that we've established here. And you're going to spot many of the simulations and tools that have been talked about. Um, we did this work with uh, my friend Tom, who is in the room today. He's rocking around somewhere. I can't see his picture, but Tom Bassendale worked alongside me to deliver this. And we shamelessly stole Bob Lasseur's ideas about the command structures, which I'll present in a second. And then happily, this is the power of social media. Um, Tom was tweeting about this approach that we were doing. And then he was approached by the American Chemical Society from to present some of the work which spurred us on to evaluate it. So we've done all of this really quickly. So the, this story starts in our master's module. We run a research program that runs over three semesters and I lead semester two. During semester two, they undertake in, in the normal days, a five week set of experiments which are iterative and they're done on purpose. So they do a set of experiments in one week. We take them away for post labs. They analyze their data. They go back and optimize. So they do things like PCR optimizations. They do Western blot optimizations, HPLC. They do some cell biology. So everything was looking good at Christmas. I was uh, sitting around at home thinking, brilliant. I don't have to do anything. We've sorted all the social distancing out. We know which labs we're going to deliver. And then the third of the lockdowns came being the worst of the sequels. And I was due to deliver the first lab in a week and a half's time. And I had to move everything online in a week and a half, having just rewritten it for social distancing. So what did we do? Well, the labs, they are, whole aim of the labs is iterative cycling. We want the students to perform an experiment, gain some data, analyze it, reflect and repeat. And so we wanted to redo that style of delivery in the virtual world. The assessment for this is a laboratory notebook. It was handwritten in the past. We moved quickly to a OneNote way of delivering the electronic notebooks. And the whole learning game and the assessment strategy is that the students need to do the data analysis on the data that they generate and we assess them on their ability to record the data rather than their ability to perform an experiment and get a defined outcome. So we are really testing the, um, the iterative nature. We decided we were gonna do this in Zoom rooms and we have a structure where we give a pre-lab and then a lab and a pre-lab and a lab and repeat, repeat, repeat till we get to the final week four where we have a post lab to mop everything up. And then week five is the submission of their lab book. And if I look at the time, that will be in about 30 minutes. So as long as Blackboard holds up, all of my lab books will be in at three o'clock today. And so these post labs and pre labs are there to support the student in their data analysis. And we use them to help us highlight and show the different simulations that we are going to use. So the simulations then. Loads of these you've seen already because they've been highlighted in different um, talks within the network already. And we didn't create any simulations. We went and used pre-existing open access simulations. So there's this really nice PCR simulation where you can alter things like annealing temperatures and buffer compositions, and it reports back yields and purity. And the game for the students was to iteratively go through recording what they did to get the best yields that they could. There's this HPLC simulation that Bob demonstrated about a week um, in the last meeting where the aim is to change different solvent compositions and resolve different peaks. And then there's a lovely little script that Peter Clapper had written for us where he generates unique data sets around a variety of simple 
uh, biochemical techniques. So there's a little bit of spectroscopy in there. There's DNA analysis. There's standard curves. Um, so we cobbled together about six or seven um, virtual labs within a week. We did one on vaccine creation, one on HPLC, normal phase, gas chromatography, protein purification, PCR optimization, and Western blotting. And if you're one of our chemistry students, you would do these three, this HPLC type work. And if you're the biology students, you were doing the protein PCR and Western blotting. All of them did a vaccine creation as a formative lab to get them up to speed with using simulations and recording in their notebook. So as Bob presented, he presented a number of command prompts that he used to help people work through a given situation. In case case, it was an HPLC situation. And these CAN prompts were embedded into our lab script so the students could work in a semi-autonomous manner. We had things like do, which are direct um, commands. It's pretty much like go and open up the simulator. There was explore, which was go and fiddle around with the sliders and see what happens. There is report, which is one that we adapted from Bob's initial work, where we got them to write down specific bits in their lab book. So it would be report how you optimize the HPLC or report how you have been optimizing the PCR. There was plot tasks where we got them to create standard curves or plot data against, for example, changes in polarity within the HPLC. And then there was write prompt questions which were set for reflections or in some cases, situations that we'd often seen within the physical labs that we wanted them to reflect on. So the, the classic one is, I've ran my DNA gel, there are no bands, what's happened, problem solve it. And the answer pretty much is always, you forgot to put the ethidium bromide in. So we use these to structure our scripts. And they're far too small on this screen, but they were set up into parts. So this part says, go and work out the DNA concentration, go to this simulator, report your values and put them in your book. And we structured within that way. Now, we wanted to make sure that the delivery replicated our physical delivery as close as possible. Our labs are always held on the same day, and the structure of our building is that our physical laboratories are all on the same floor of a rather beautiful-looking 60s skyscraper-type thing. And we split everybody up into different courses, and they'd all run their physical lab in a different lab across the corridor. So what we did was to replicate that in Zoom. We sent out a link in the morning. All of the students would sign up and join that room. So for things like the virtual lab, you're talking about 60 odd students. We used breakout rooms to move them into the laboratory classes that we'd already timetabled. They were typically along course lines. And we had an academic per breakout room to act as a facilitator and be there to answer questions throughout the day. And we repeated that it was four times we repeated that structure in different combinations of courses and academics. Now, halfway through, we decided, wouldn't it be a great idea to evaluate this? And so we quickly pulled together um, a student perceptions survey that we ran towards the end of the program. And we got the ethics through really quickly because I was able to adapt ethics forms that I'd used in the past. We weren't really asking for any sensitive information other than the course of study. There was an 81% response rate. And that was pretty much along the lines of within the post lab, I said to the students, oh, before you go, please fill in my form. And so most of them did that. And so we were assessing the student perception of how this virtual delivery has gone. First question was to gauge the level of challenge and support within the environment we created. And so this is a matrix where we have low challenge on one side, high challenge on the other, with high support and low support running on the other axis. And the size of the dot is the number of respondents, modal scores, showed the students found the labs challenging, but were also supported, going down to the um, low challenge. And when you actually look at the individual data, the low challenge ones here were for our pre-existing home students that pretty much knew what they were doing. We didn't record that data on the form, but I know that from the student numbers. 
uh, we created an environment that was both challenging and supporting. The students reported back the experience was of benefit for them. And we got things in this word cloud from a three word, what, how did you find it? So interesting, informative, good. Now this one here threw us a little bit. This is frustrating. Frustrating came up in a number of situations. And here is my first lesson of delivering en masse in live situations via virtual. Make sure the simulation that you're going to use can deal with the number of hits within it because I crashed the PCR simulator twice during the course of the um, labs that we were doing. So I apologize if anybody else was trying to use it that day. We effectively did a denial of service attack on it and crashed the website. So some of the simulations, the free ones, can only handle a limited number of people. It's something to be aware of. But generally, they thought it was a good experience. The command prompts went down incredibly well with the students. They all agreed or strongly agreed that they helped them work their way through the labs and help them construct their lab books. So I will be rewriting my physical labs for next year and retaining this command structure. The students said they generally enjoyed the virtual labs. So 68% said they enjoyed it. They generally said that they increased their data confidence and ability to analyze data as a result of it. And the Zoom breakout rooms did help them. And this echoed what they said at the start about being supported. Being in those rooms meant there was about 10 to 15 per room. They were with people that were new and they were able to ask questions and interact with the academic. The electronic lab books were a little bit Marmite. Um, I think this is because the OneNote that we're using was running from a cloud server. I picked OneNote because we had a site license for it, but when you're uploading and downloading large images um, over shaky Wi-Fi connections, it can be a little bit frustrating. So electronic lab books, yeah, somewhere in the middle. The students, without prompting in an open text response question, pulled back the learning objectives of the lab, saying they're able to keep lab books, analyze data, do problem solving, and use equipment. So we were pleased about that. They recognized the skills that the virtual labs were giving them. And then finally, on their reflections, and I fully agree with all their students, what the students were saying is that these simulations are really good in a, a replacement tool I wouldn't be using this style of delivery if the physical labs were in place, but I will be using these simulations almost certainly in a virtual environment as preparative material in pre-lab sessions for the physical labs going forward to the future. So we're gonna keep the command prompt, we're gonna keep the simulations, we're gonna roll them in to our pre-labs. And um, with any luck, it'll all be published in a, in a month or so's time. So big thanks to Tom who led on the chemistry side of everything. Big thanks to Robert uh, Bob Lachur, whose command prompts I shamelessly stole. Great way to collaborate. If you steal something from somebody, just drop them an email, say thanks. And then they come back with all the pedagogical underpinning to how they work. Gail and Sarah helped deliver the biological side and Peter Clapper presented all of uh, redid some of his simulations for us to remove the instructions so the students had to figure it out for themselves. So thanks very much. Brilliant, thanks David. I think that really sums up what we've been talking about in dry labs is uh, that these are all uh, an adjunct to the hands-on experience. It's never going to quite replace what we do but it's such a fantastic tool as a preparation to maximize the experience that students get in the lab when they are allowed in the physical laboratories so it's really nice to see that uh do we have any questions for david okay coffee one you did this with um, master's level students do yes. you think that the same thing would work with undergraduates or is it a bit more tricky in terms of do you think that the master's students have got a, a skill set where they can go in and do this kind of self-directed learning which wouldn't work so well with undergraduates or no, we used exactly the same thing with our first years. So we've, del we've um, delivered and developed a LAC Operon based uh, virtual lab where they have to go through and change all the different parameters. And within that lab, that was run by uh, Mel Lacey, but we 
had a virtual like operon simulator, which they had to do, and each student was given their own unique data set through a random number generator applet that we pulled together, and we used the command prompts in there. We just didn't analyze it in this because um, it's that's still going. Okay, that's really interesting. Uh, Steve Radford said, what would be your ideal suggestion for avoiding crashing the free simulators if they have limited capacity? Yeah, so we addressed that in the second iteration, Steve. The first iteration of the lab, I crashed it. The second iteration, I had three parts to the lab that we were running. And so I split the cohort and got one half to run the PCR in the morning and the other half to run the PCR in the afternoon. And that meant we only crashed it about three o'clock instead of 11 o'clock. So we split it that way. Um, Stress test it. I think you, the only, I only figured this out through stress testing. The HPLC one didn't have any issues. It was just the PCR one that crashed. Keep the numbers down. Cohort sizes were anything from about 10 to 15 per Zoom room. So that's typical to what we would deliver in a physical lab with about 15 students per academic. So we replicated it there. So yeah, about that sort of size. But the total cohort that did the assessment was 60. So 60 in the Zoom room on the day, but about 10, 15 per room. Yeah, great. It's good to know that that's the sort of the, the upper thresholds of what the PCR can, can cope with then. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much, David. Uh, and thank you for stepping in at the last minute to, to present that. That's uh, greatly appreciated.